Hello, Eric. It's nice to be with you again. It seems like a long time since we had our last conversation. Yes. But, it, but it's great to be talking again. And thanks for doing this follow-on session with us. So for those who don't know you, Eric is a senior lecturer in educational leadership at the Open University. So, and I've known you, so I must put my hands up. I've known you for a while now, so, so you're a friend as well. So I'm going to ask you, as, as we start this conversation, obviously there's been a lot of reflection um, since we started talking about um, the teaching and the education experience in the two mm -hmm. pandemics, COVID and racism, mm -hmm. and what that means in terms of whether it's a fair playing field for this generation. And so there were lots of conversations around this. But you talk specifically about the importance of a diverse and inclusive curriculum yeah. and why it's important for students to have a voice in what they learn and how they learn. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to expand on that and any other points that you feel came out of that conversation mm -hmm. that you'd like to pick up on as a start. Yeah. Yeah, um, the reason why I kind of brought that up um, in our conversations is, 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 is in relation to another bigger conversation that is happening that we probably didn't touch on, which is around decolonization of the curriculum. And um, like, like others, um, I do appreciate and understand the need for the use of the word decolonization, but I'm more comfortable with inclusion and diversity. So for me, ensuring that our curriculum is inclusive and diverse is very, very important because there's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that students perform better um, when, they, when they're exposed to more views. Um, so when we talk about inclusion in terms of um, any aspect of the curriculum, we're looking at gender. So the voices that we're hearing or the literature that we're drawing on includes the voices of women, the published work of women. It includes people of color um, as well. So we're drawing on a diverse curriculum, a, a diverse literature or diverse views or, or, or diverse research from, from across, across the entire globe. So we're looking at Africa, we're looking at Asia, we're looking at uh, um, um, Europe, we're looking at the Americas. Um, as well, so it, so that it's not skewed towards just a, a, a kind of a pan-European or Anglo-centric uh, um, framework. So that's for me. That's very, very, very important because it it, it enriches the curriculum, um, yeah. and, and 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 for students, it broadens their horizons in terms of people's worldviews. Because I mean, communities, societies do shape our worldviews, and so it's very, very important that any literature that we're reading, we bear all those in mind um, in terms of how the author's worldview may have been shaped by the part of the world they come from. So exposing students to this diverse and inclusive um, range of curriculum, for me, is very, very, very important. And I think that's always come out in our conversations around, yeah. you know, the need to have more. Yeah. you know um views in yeah. in that curriculum so that people can have a sense of they can find themselves but also they can structure their thinking yeah quite globally because yeah. we do live in a global world yeah. at the moment yeah i agree and that, that that's really yeah. cool. and, and 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 that's relating to one other thing that i was going to add in terms of combat combating prejudice so it's very very important because it helps to combat prejudice so the, the more diverse you have diversity you have in the curriculum people of different um, races can actually see um, um, other people's views. And, and what it does is within the student community and even the academic community that are working around those views or those or, or the, the types of publications or literature that the, or, and, and even theoretical frameworks um, that they're talking about, it, it brings about debate. But at the same time, it, 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 through, through debate, we learn, we learn from each other. And for me, that's, that's very, very important because it helps to remove some prejudices that people may have. Because I, I give a typical example of somebody draw um, a, 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 some work that we did um, in the past where we were talking about leadership, um, leadership uh, models. Yeah. And Ubuntu leadership, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a leadership um, approach that, that came up. And, and colleagues had, some colleagues had not been exposed to Ubuntu leadership. And this is, this is a, way, a, a way of leading that, that, that has its roots in South, South Africa. So, but people, but others had heard about it, but not realized that actually has its roots in South Africa. So it's through these conversations that for me, you're able to sort of 
sometimes unpack some of these issues and, and, and remove people's prejudices. Yes. And I, and I know you, you did say on Sunday that the issue is not racism, it's, it's inclusion. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the need to focus on, on those inclusive practices more. And that almost will then deal with the race issue if we yes. did it that way. Yeah. I, I think for me that, that, that we should think about that being, being a starting point. Because if we focus too much on, on, on just the race issue, we exclude others. And we're hearing noises already about all life, issues around all lives matter. It's not just all black lives matter. But that shouldn't detract from the issues we have with, with blackness in terms of the attainment gap, in terms of disproportionate, uh, 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 um, disproportionately being discriminated against in public services and other, as well. there, there, there's evidence around that. So, so we're not saying those issues do not ex exist. They do exist. But the bigger issue is about inclusion. It's about including everyone. Because there are issues with disability as well. People who are disabled feel marginalized um, at times. There are issues with women. I mean, in some cases, women feel marginalized. And we know that in terms of the pay gap, um, and we know the, the level of underrepresentation in specific positions, in some positions um, of authority or leadership in the UK and elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, so it's not just it's not just a race issue. Race is, is, is part of a much bigger issue. And, and, and my concern is that if we're not careful, um, we, we will not resolve the issue. I mean, we've been, I mean, this issue has been going on for ages. And I think we, 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 for educators like myself, I think I'd like it when people kind of skew more towards looking at, in, looking at it from an inclusion angle and looking at it from a diversity angle. And, and, and I'm hoping that through that, widening those um, horizons for everyone involved in terms of your curriculum, your teaching, your support, you get to break down some of these barriers. Yeah. And, and so I can give you a very specific example because I, I have a report in front of me yeah. um, about an interview that was done for 20 of the UK's total 25 black female professors. Um, and it was done for the University and College Union in 2019. Okay. And it says that the, the 20 professors described a persistent culture of bullying, racial stereotyping, and microaggression within higher education. It goes on to say that such low levels of diversity and representation have serious implications for BAME students' sense of belonging and their perceptions of the possibility of pursuing a career in academia. You know, and, and this speaks exactly to some of the points that you, you've been talking about. Actually, it goes on to say, and I'll just read this, there's much evidence to date has concluded that a whole institution approach to removing racial inequalities is needed to respond robustly to the multifaceted issues that, exceed, that exist, including the BAME attainment gap. Yeah. Now, it, that is in your space, isn't it? So It is. So. It's multifaceted. <laughs> and I like the way it ended, using that word. What were multifaceted? The problem is multifaceted. That's 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 the issue. So if you we pick on just this example where they are black, yes, and they are women, yes. So in terms of the discrimination, is it because they are black or is it because they are women or or both? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> or, or both. So 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 for me, it, the issue is not just about blackness; it's about inclusion. Why should a woman, a black person, a disabled person be disadvantaged in any shape or form? Mm. That's, that's, that, that, that's where I, so, I, I, I sort of, uh, I sort of come, 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 come from. And, and, and it's a shame that this, this, is, this, is, this um, um, experience is, is what um, people are having. And, and, and it, it, we, we, we can't um, kind of dismiss it. I mean, this is, this is probably maybe some quotes from lived experience. Mm. So it's very difficult um, to dismiss the experiences that um, colleagues are, are having. But it's, it's, it's realistic. I mean, in my own institution, there are very few um, black professors, either male or female. Um, so so they're they right in terms of the issue about students not feeling um, a sense of belonging. I don't think it's just, as just students, even academics. There, there, is that, there will be that issue of not or that same kind of sense of belonging. And, and I use myself as an example. Um, I'm on kind of the top scale of, a, of, of, of my current um, post in terms of senior lectureship. My next promotion is likely to, it, if it comes, will be to professorship. But then the question you ask yourself is, 
will you ever get there when you look at your own institution and there's probably no black professor? You ask yourself, um, will you sort of ever get there? So it's, it's the challenge, the challenge, the challenge is, is, is sort of sort of real. But I think I, I go back to, to, to what I said. I, I said earlier on, there probably may be somebody also sitting there, but there isn't a, there isn't a, a, a disabled professor um, either, or how many women professors um, have we got? I mean, the gender issue has also been on the agenda for years. Um, and, and, but one of the things that has been successful in terms of the gender issue is, is one, this issue around um, this program around people like me. Yeah. So, and it's been used particularly in STEM where the, the gap is much bigger. But I think it does work. And, and, and I think that's what this report that you read is kind of suggesting that when people see others like them, it does help raise aspiration. Yeah. So in terms of institutions and, and as they go on to, in terms of the solutions, yes, I, I agree with them. It's got to be done at the, institutional, at the institutional level, but strategies have to be in place beyond the institutional level. Because, I'm, yeah. Go on, Eric. Strategies have to be beyond the institutional level because you actually even have to be an academic before you even become a professor. So when I joined my when I joined the OU in my faculty, I think I was the only black. So 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 if I'm the only black, the chances of having more black professors is even lower. Exactly. So 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 it's not just an institution. So yes, solutions can be localized at the institutional level, but there has to be a much bigger drive in terms of. Um, supporting people and getting people attracted to academia. Um, and one of the ways is, is, is this um, program around um, getting, seeing people like yourselves or people like me, so that, that inspires and, 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 and draws people to, 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 to particular areas of work. And I think the challenge, if I think about it over mm -hmm. the years, is some of the other areas of, of difference of diversity, whether that's disability or gender, you know, seem to have made significant progress more than the issue of race. And I think that's yeah. the challenge that yeah. I think most people feel. You know, it's, it's not, not acknowledging that those others are also important, but it just mm -hmm. feels like the appetite for the race dialogue, which thank God we're starting to have now, yeah. has not always been as, as critically important Mm. as passed from gender but there's a lot we can learn yeah there's a lot we can learn from those practices in terms yeah. of how we can strategically start to mobilize you mm. know actions around some of these issues and i think that's where the difference is in my mind yeah yeah and possibly because the race issue is also a bit more complex mm. um because uh, as you probably will know another um, term i'm uncomfortable with with the BAME yes. um, terminology all being lumped um, together that makes it even more difficult. So per perhaps um, it comes across as not much um, movement has been made in terms of kind of the progress that we would, we would like to have or, or the successes we would have hoped would have kind of chopped down by now, mainly because it's, 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 a, it's a much more complex, uh, complex, complex issue um, because very often, um, blacks and Asians uh, sort of come to come to the fore, but there are other um, ethnic groups that feel disadvantaged um, as well. So, so yes, race is an issue. Um, I, I can't kind of dismiss that, but um, I want us to see it as part of, of a much bigger issue. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, and I think I I want to ask you this question because when I spoke to you um, before now. Mm -hmm. You talked about your own personal journey and how yeah. in this sort of COVID race where everything has just sort of mm -hmm. expounded in our faces, you know, where we've had to challenge ourselves. And I know you talked about you also challenging yourself. So I just want you to share a little bit about the shifts or the, yeah. or the change in mindset or what you are thinking about now, okay. you know, maybe that you weren't before. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, on reflection, I think um, I've kind of shifted. Well, I've read more um, being on lockdown, <laughs> as I always do. But I've, I, 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 my thinking has shifted um, as well in terms of how I more, more or less talk about race and also respond to race issue and deal with race um, race issues. Because, I mean, those who know me well <laughs> um, will know that I'm, I'm, I can be very vocal 
um, in the right uh, right spaces, but I can also be very kind of um, quiet and reflective uh, in, in, in certain spaces. But one thing that um, I've kind of had to do more is being more proactive in terms of tackling race issues. So whilst I've always considered myself not to be a racist, um, I think I've kind of learned a bit from John Machi's book in terms of um, what, when he talks about anti-racism. So, so he, he's more or less encouraging people like me, yourself, not just to um, kind of um, frown against racism or challenge racism, but he wants us to be a bit more proactive and be anti-racist. So what that means is that we actually, I'm actually looking out now um, and then I, will, I would have done in the past. Uh, I'm looking out now to challenge um, behaviors and to support um, colleagues. So in my own institution, for instance, I've kind of agreed and, um, to be one of the equality and diversity champions within, within my faculty. And I see myself playing uh, an instrumental role in terms of is uh, tackling issues around race. So whilst I would have considered in the past considered myself as kind of not being racist and I will challenge the issues as I see them, I think um, based on all the issues that have happened, I think I'm taking it a bit more, a bit further. I've taken it up a, a, a notch further in terms of how I deal with issues around race, either at the workplace or even within my own community. And, and I remember one of the statements you, you put on the chat um, on, on Sunday where you said, I think people were talking about being the first, you know. Yeah. They said, I've been the first and only on many occasions. I'm not treating this as a burden, but rather mm -hmm. an opportunity to question and educate. Yeah. I think that plays into a bit of what you're talking about it, it, now. It, it, as, 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 exactly. Um, and sometimes people feel overwhelmed when they are the first. And if you remember what I, when I said, I mean, when I joined the faculty, I was the only kind of black person and black African as well. Um, and I didn't, I didn't see that as a burden. I mean, I saw that as an, as an opportunity to shine. And, 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 and it was, and for me, it was an opportunity for the faculty to also see the benefits of diversity. And I'm pleased to say that I hope I've made um, the necessary co um, contribution and, and, and probably maybe um, giving people some the opportunity to see other view, um, kind of either other views that are not same as theirs, because I'm not shy at all to remind people at meetings that I'm African, I, I migrated to this country as an adult. So I have the lived experience in, 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 in Africa. I've luckily traveled across parts of Africa as well and have different experiences. So when, my, when I'm challenging colleagues at meetings, I, I, I'm, I'm bold enough to remind people that um, living in the UK and basing your views on what you read mm. or what is reported um, on, 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 on TV or radio is not necessarily the same as what you will see when you live in, in, in the country. So you go to Ghana or Nigeria for a week or two weeks to do some academic research and come back and try to tell me that you know Nigeria or you know Ghana. For me, it's laughable. So, so, so and I'm sure you, you, experienced, you experienced that as well um, um, in, in, your, in your work. So, 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 so that's one of the key things that I, I'm, I'm hoping that I've been able to contribute and I'm kind of proud to say that even now within my own department, not just, not even the faculty, within my own department, because there's been a restructure. So we now have a much bigger faculty with colleagues coming from health and social care where we have a few black women um, in there. So, but it's still very minority, but at least we have a few. But now even within my own um, school, which is education, childhood, youth and sport, we've got about um, six black people from the time I joined. So I'm hoping that um, over the years, <laughs> I would have kind of um, made some kind of impact in terms of people recognizing that divergent views or, or, um, are, are equally um, welcomed and important. Excellent. And, and, I, and I wanted to pick up something as well. So I'm, I'm moving on to another conversation we had. Yeah. And, and we started this conversation because we were talking about the statues, you know, yeah. um, and about yes. young voices. And, and I think you gave me a particular example of a young girl as well, um, you know, in, in, in that account. And I know that you also made a comment about 
um, Africa has a lot to do with the solutions about race. We need more voices from the mm -hmm. diverse nations in Africa. Yeah. So I'm just going to, to ask you to speak to that because it really intrigued me and I thought it was really, really powerful what you said. So I'm going to ask you to mm. say that again. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of reflecting on the issues with the kind of um, well, removal, distraction, demolition. I'm not sure um, what word best describes what was going on with regards to the, the statutes, the statutes around, around the UK and, 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 and the US. And, and my take on that was that some of these statues still uh, are, mount, are still mounted in Africa. So if we're so if we're so unhappy, we're so upset about these the contribution of these people to the slave trade, and and the and, the, and their contribution to the suppression of the black race, you go to Africa. Streets are named after them. Mm. Streets are named after them. Roads are named after them. We've got their statues um, all, all, all over. So that's why I keep on going on, that, on about the solution doesn't only lie in Europe and America. The solution, Africa has to be part of the solution. So when our young voice, so when our youngsters lift up their voices here, they should find ways to make sure that those voices are heard in Africa as well, are heard all across the nations in Africa, uh, because that's one of the ways in which we can break this. Until we get to the point where a young person in Africa is confident enough to sit around the table with um, the appear from any other country and be confident enough to challenge where they have to challenge and contribute and they have to uh, where they have to contribute and feel that their contribution is equally valued i don't think we're going to make any headway mm. so our youngsters who feel that yes they're going to kind of be activists and and, and, and be very proactive in europe have to find ways and social media is a great opportunity to do that they have to find ways in which they can engage um, the rest of, um, um, of the countries in Africa um, to ensure that whatever we're talking about here in terms of breaking down these barriers, some of those conversations are happening there as well because it does, it, because it does exist. It does exist there. And until some of the, some education is done, and, and, and I use a very interesting example um, that happened in the University of, of Ghana campus where the statue of um, somebody was um, um, uh, one academic who researches, um, um, I think, anthropology and history, identified one of the statues on campus as, uh, as being somebody who was racist against Blacks and wanted it taken out. And this statue had been there for quite some time and even and this person is an American who was teaching in, on the University of Ghana, at the University of Ghana, and colleagues had not even picked that up. And even if they did, it's like the, what I was saying, they probably blinked to, to that. Yes. And he raised this issue, he got a student um, body sort of um, revved up in terms of those, because he took that as an opportunity to educate people about that person. Mm, mm. You see, and, and that's what happened. He took the opportunity, because people really didn't know what that, person had written about what they had said in the past, but they were happy to have their statue up there because they are a famous person across the world. But this academic took the opportunity to educate people and educate uh, um, 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 his peers about some of the writings and some of the things that this person had said. And eventually, he, I'll say he won because the statue was kind of taken down. So for me, that's, that, those, are, those are some of the proactive things that need to be done. We can't do it just here because these similar issues are happening back, back um, in Africa. Excellent. I mean, I, I, and I think that's such a good point because I, I just yeah. think with, with technology, our young people yeah. have a strong voice. Yeah. You know, and, and they have a momentum with them at, at the moment. And I think for me, I hadn't thought about the Africa side yeah. You said it, which is why I wanted you to say it again today. Yeah. Because that yeah. is a, a very fair point. I, I mean, I, I'm remembering Abbott Macaulay Road um, somewhere down in, in Lagos. So those who know Lagos <laughs> will remember Abbott Macaulay Road. I mean, we, we have those streets and, and, and I yeah. don't know if Abbott Macaulay did, I'll be honest with you, but mm -hmm. we have those streets that have been yeah. there since the days of, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. those historical days. So, so yeah. really good point. Yeah, and, and as I said to the youth, I mean, if Greta Thunberg can, can go around the world to take on climate, uh, take on world leaders yes. in terms of climate action, why can't our young people take on the world in terms of race relations? Yes, yes, yes. 
So I hope you're hearing, <laughs> you know. And, and, and then I, I, I want to come to talk about COVID a little bit, because yeah. obviously we talked about the two pandemics. And, and there's been a lot of um, conversation about the, the impact of, of COVID um, and whether that also sort of causes even greater, you know, disadvantage or disparity for communities that are already struggling. So I'm looking at a, um, something that the Vice Chancellor of, of Oxford University said, where he said the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the deep educational inequalities in our society. And, and there's a lot of, of narrative here around, you know, those from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, talking mm -hmm. about assessments and the different methods of doing assessments, talking about predicted grades, all those kind of things that has had to change during yeah. this period, yeah. including a different way of learning. Mm -hmm. And obviously we're in the month of August, which is where results are all coming out, you mm -hmm. know, at different levels. And we've got our young people, you know, some will be excited, some will be, there will be some that may be disappointed. You know, we'll get a mixed bag as we get into, into August. Now I know the Open University might be in a different place because Open University has been doing online distance yeah. learning, you know, for, for years, I mean, yeah. and, and doing it excellently well. So what is your view on all of this? And what would you say to a young person who may be sitting there feeling that maybe I haven't had the opportunity to, to really put in, you know, my 150% to, yeah. to get that good grade or to, to get that good result because yeah. COVID hasn't enabled me to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think at, 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 um, at the last webinar, I think um, colleagues tried to sort of respond to that. I think in group started looking at that in terms of um, the impact at, in, the, in the secondary sector in particular um, and the use of kind of predicted grades because there's enough evidence to suggest that the youngsters, are particularly um, black youngsters, tend to sort of put in their effort during the exam and don't particularly sort of putting a lot of effort in terms of their continuous assessment. So, so, so if, if that is the case, then yes, they are likely to be impacted the greatest because a lot of the results will be based on kind of algorithms that have been built around um, continuous assessment because people couldn't actually congregate to take, to take exams. So it's, it's quite unfortunate if that, if that, that is the case. Um, but um, it will be very difficult to reverse that. And I think we're still not sure what the impact of COVID-19 is going to have on, yeah, on, on, on this generation. It's, it's, it's still early days. And, and, and this, this is one of them. The, the, this impact is one of them. Whether that kind of um, hinders people's um, progression is, is one that I think we will have to wait for results to come out. We'll have to wait for university entries um, to be failed before we start kind of um, making any um, decisions. Cause I like to base some of these decisions on evidence. Mm. So I think um, being an evidence informed practitioner as I like to describe myself, I like, I'd like to wait to see the extent of, 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 um, of disadvantage that will, will, will come out of um, the, the algorithms that have had to be built to be able to respond to, to the challenge that we have now. But, um, but I mean, if you get a university place, for me, the key thing is um, first of all, learn your lessons. Mm. <laughs> so for the youngsters, first of all, learn your lessons. Continuous assessment is a good thing, and um, and 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 begin to kind of adapt your way, adapt how you learn. Mm. And um, that, that I, I, in most universities, if you if you speak to the student support teams. Um, they, 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 they usually work just around the way um, students actually um, learn. So reading, so things around um, critical thinking, things around um, reading for understanding um, and, and, and issues around that I think will be very, very important for young people to, to pick up. I say that from my own experience. I mean, as I said, I came um, here as a kind of uh, an adult um, and during my master's, um, during my first master's, I did experience that I had to unlearn quite a few habits mm -hmm. that I picked up at university in Ghana and learn new habits or new ways of learning. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so whilst my experience may not necessarily be the same as the youngsters now, I think um, waiting to the end is always not the best. Um, I think this should be a lesson that continuous assessment 
and, and continually sort of making sure that you are abreast with what you're studying and not leave everything to last minute. It's not always a good way to learn, in my opinion. I think that is good. I think I, I hope they hear that. I'm, I'm hearing and thinking, okay, I need to find those papers for my children. Critical mm -hmm. reading and reading for understanding and yeah. the importance of the continuous assessment. Because I think culturally, even if I look at my education back at home before coming to the UK, yeah. the exam was the almighty exam, wasn't it? It was kind of like that exam was the thing, you know, and almost everything. Everything else, exactly. Matters. So you just sort of focused in on that exam and I guess as parents too maybe that's where we then put all our energies in with exactly. our children okay the final exam we get yeah. the tutors then we get you know the text we get everything that is required yeah. because we're thinking okay this is the this is exam, it. you know exactly. is that is that continuous assessment so I think it's a lesson both for the young person but also for the parents yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah because when parents see because of the way we kind of um, we were socialized in terms of um, um, assessment and examination, when you see that your youngster probably maybe didn't do so well or as you expect on a continuous assessment, you'll say, oh yeah, that's fine. I'll put in some extra classes and make sure that when it gets to the exam, you're going to nail it. Um, I think um, whilst that, that may have its, its benefits, I think we have to change that mindset in terms of the way we learn and and all not always one way to cram everything at the end i think it's very very important to sort of it, le, le, learning should be a habit i mean it should be a habit it, every now and then you you're reflecting of what you on what you've learned you're asking yourself questions or you're asking your parents to ask you questions you know and having conversations with people in terms of what you're reading and getting them to challenge some of the views because then that takes you back in terms of what you read. And that's part of what we call um, reading for understanding and not just reading for pleasure or just reading um, um, uh, um, 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 or skim reading. But actually when you read, you try to sort of distill what's in there, get people to challenge you, sharing with others and get them to challenge you. And it takes you to go back and sometimes you reread it and you realize that, yeah, actually I probably missed this bit. This is, this, this is something new that I actually add to my repertoire. Excellent. I like it. I like that. Thank you so much for that. Now I'm going to ask you just a few more questions. Because one of yeah. the questions that came in on the day, yeah. someone said, as an African myself, we've been integrating from the start and yet at the bottom of the worst receiving end. Is integration really the solution to race? <laughs> but are we, are we at the bottom end? I mean, <laughs> so so yeah again maybe that's how that person feels but i don't feel that way i don't feel i've never felt that um i'm at the bottom and again my experiences may be different to 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 other people's um experiences but back to the main issue in terms of uh, integration yes i mean um we, we we need to integrate but integration is not necessarily the only way um, to, 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 to um, eradicate discrimination. Um, you can integrate as much as you want. If the other person is not, or other people that you're trying to integrate into are not well-educated and not welcoming of diverse, that, that they may, you may bring in diverse views mm -hmm. or you may be bringing in um, a diverse culture or you may be bringing in um, a diverse way of life. No matter what you do, it's it's not going to work. So integration is just one little bit of 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 of, of the ingredients we need to overcome these um, um, racial racial barriers. It is important, but it's not that magic bullet. Um, I think education is key, and and a lot of education has been going on for ages. But it's, again, as you said, it's a multifaceted issue. So education um, is one of them. There has to be some positive action in some places to ensure that where um, black people have been successful, they are not undermined, but also shown to the rest of the world so that people see that they actually can also aspire um, to that level. Um, there also has to be um, issues, issues around support because in some, in some fields, people feel a bit marginalized just because of their race, so institutionally, those there has to be support mechanisms. Although there are laws um, and processes and procedures in place, because of the nature, sometimes the nature of how racism rests itself, it can be subtle. So, 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 so support 
um, for groups that feel marginalized, I think it's also very, very important and part of, um, of the solution. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. And, and finally, on, on the day, you gave some final words. And I'm just yeah. going to read it in case you don't remember what you said. <laughs> but you yeah. said in your final words, do not focus on what you can't do yeah. or can't achieve mm. or the barriers ahead. Rather, mm. focus on your strengths and your talents. Mm. In that process, try and build on your social and professional network. Yeah. That's one key thing that will be a driver for change. Yeah. And, and you will still say that today, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'll still, I'll still say that because I think that's one of the things that I, um, one of the first things that I'll say I, I learned um, post, um, post uh, masters in this country in terms of building my personal, uh, building my professional network. And I'll say a lot of opportunities that I've had have come from people that I've known through, through my network. So you, having all the qualifications it's not enough. I've come to understand that um, having all the qualifications is not necessarily enough. I think it's making the right connections personally and professionally has advantages. And, 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 and I also sort of entreat um, our young adults to kind of think about that through their studies and through their career. So one of the first things you'd want to do whilst you are in uni is to build a good relationship and rapport with your supervisor. That's where I started. So I had a really good super, uh, relationship with um, and the, the, um, um, Peter Carling, who supervised my kind of first master's thesis. And I used to kind of send him emails in terms of what I wanted to do, my career aspirations. And through that, I got connected to one or two others. And then I entered the world of work and um, made sure that I was very, very, very um, proactive in terms of looking out for people that I think could contribute to, to my career and to my success. And, and for me, I'll always kind of encourage people not to just sit back when they're at a conference or when they meet people, but actually make the effort to connect to, connect to people. Excellent. So finally, um, if you were to recommend a book, so it's summer and we've got lots of time to do reading and you read a lot. You <laughs> yes. know, I know you read a lot. So I want to yeah. read the book. What book would you recommend for me to read this summer? Okay, can I pull it off my shelf yes. now for you? Sure, yes, okay, please. all right. <laughs> this is a good one, folks. Um, Focus by Daniel Goleman. Writing that down right now. Focus by Daniel Goleman. Okay, I shall be buying that today. <laughs> Okay, I yeah, guess you've yeah. got a bookmark. Exactly, I'm not, done, I'm not done yet, but I'm enjoying it so much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read that and I'll encourage anybody else that's listening to read it. You know, if yeah. everything is recommended <laughs> and we're going to read it, because I know you read and I think that, yeah. that's the beauty of this. I think we all need to read a bit more, you know. Yeah. We all need yeah. to open our minds and read a bit more because that's how we educate ourselves and that's how we also get a, a real view and a, and a good perspective exactly. of some of the issues exactly. that we're talking about, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. so I think that that is good. So that, that's all, except you have any words for parents or government or anybody you want to throw in there, but <laughs> not, we're, we're done. <laughs> no, you don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Another interview. Because you, know, you, you know I've got a lot, of, a lot, to, say, a lot to say for <laughs> governments based on, on my international development work. I've got a lot to say for governments. And the first one is the measure of DFID and FCO. I yes, mean, yes. I and, the, the, and the impact that's going to have on my work. I but know. that's another full... Yes, we'll, we'll go to that interview on that one. <laughs> that's not another one. But Eric, thank you so much. It yeah, is, thank you too for inviting me. There's been so much you've said in this interview that's really valuable and useful to me personally, but I'm sure to everybody listening. So, so thanks a lot. Appreciate it, and you'll be back. I know that. All right. We'll see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Uh, bye.